I picked up this original Blueberry iMac G3 from a friend who got it from an old storage locker for $50, sight unseen and condition unknown. It had apparently been in there for years and I have no idea if it'll even power on. Can we get it up and running and see what games and software it can handle after all this time? Well, stick around to find out because things didn't go according to plan. Today, we look at the iconic iMac G3 home computer. Originally unveiled on May 6, 1998, it was the first major project to be presented by Steve Jobs after his return to Apple Computers as CEO following his ousting in 1985. It hit markets later that year on August 15th and was priced at $1,299. I've wanted one of these ever since it was released. When I was in college, there were computer labs full of them, and while I was Team PC through and through, they just seemed to be so fun and portable. That's why, when the opportunity came up, I jumped on it. The first generation iMac saw a minor revision shortly after release, making a few cosmetic changes, including the replacement of its original tray CD-ROM drive with a slot-loading one. It came pre-installed with OS 8 and included a matching keyboard as well as a mouse. What it didn't come with was a floppy drive or any of Apple's previously proprietary ports, adopting dual USB ports instead. And while many versions included both FireWire and VGA ports, Mine is one of the lower end ones which omitted them. Visually, the iMac is the perfect representation of what was considered cool and advanced at the time. Translucent plastic was everywhere on electronics back then, with these devices eager to show you what was going on under the hood, and I personally love it. Up top, we have a 15 inch CRT display capable of resolutions of up to 1024 by 768, all being powered by the ATI Rage 128VR chipset with 8MB of SD RAM. Below that we have a slot loading 24x CD-ROM drive as well as a set of integrated speakers. This is the Blueberry version of the iMac, so it sported a 350MHz PowerPC 750 processor coupled with 64 megs of PC100 memory expandable up to 512. And for storage it should have a 6GB IDE drive. My iMac was missing the original puck mouse and instead included this broken Pro mouse. Luckily, I was able to track down a matching mouse on eBay, and I'll be able to use this spare Apple mouse until it shows up. Before we get to testing, it's pretty filthy, so I'm going to want to give it a good cleaning. The handle up top looks like it had some sort of liquid pool in it and then dry. I started by giving it a couple of sprays of alcohol, and then giving it a pretty thorough wipe down with some paper towel. Then I proceeded to spray and wipe the rest of the exterior. The screen is covered with little droplets of what I can only hope is reddish brown paint. It was stuck on pretty well considering it's a glass surface, but with a little bit of wiping and elbow grease it came right off. Then it was time to turn my attention to the keyboard. At first, I thought I could just get away with using alcohol on paper towel and wiping down the five sides of the keys, but it soon became clear that that wouldn't be enough and it was time to strip the keys off. With the keys removed, I'm now glad I put in the extra effort because the body of this keyboard is disgusting. So I sent the keys off for a warm soapy bath, and then began using alcohol and an anti-static brush to wipe out the space underneath the keys. And after just a little time, this keyboard is as clean as my browser history, and you can see just how much junk came out of it. I feel a lot better about using it now. And now that the keys have been soaking for a bit, it was time to clean them. And it took more time than I'd care to admit. I'd take each key out, wipe down its five surfaces, and then place it off to the side to dry. Now I can place them all aside and make sure they're thoroughly dry before reassembly, so I'll just use another regular USB keyboard to start testing the machine in the meantime. And fingers crossed. I hooked everything up, pressed the power button, and... We have life! Well, sort of. Everything looks good, but I don't hear the hard drive running, and it's complaining about no operating system. But it's possible the drive is just quiet and has been wiped, so let's try the OS 8.6 installation CD. I'll also apologize for the flickering on the screen that you're going to see during parts of this video. None of the iMac refresh frequencies match what my camera can do. For some, I can set my camera to 15 frames per second and get a choppy but stable image. For others, there's not much I can do. As for the Mac, uh, no dice. The hard drive is not detecting and most likely dead, so we're going to have to dig deeper into it. 
Flipping it upside down, there is a flap that gives us access to the RAM, as well as the slot where you can install the optional airport card. And while you can see the hard drive through the door, there's really not much you can do with it. So we'll remove the two screws towards the front of the case, and then we'll remove this snap panel on the back. Under it we'll find four more large screws to remove, and after that it should just be a matter of pulling the base off. With the base removed, we reveal a rather large RF shield. And after a few more screws, the RF shield comes off, giving us our first look at the logic board, which is surprisingly dust-free after all these years. While we're in here, I'm going to go ahead and upgrade the original 64 megs of RAM to 512, which is the highest amount that Apple officially supports. It will, unofficially, take up to 1 gig of RAM, but these are the largest modules that I have, and it's still going to be a huge performance increase over the original 64. Now it's time to turn our attention to the hard drive. I'll go ahead and disconnect the cables from the drive, and then I'll unscrew it from the chassis. Next, I'll remove the RAM that I just installed so that the hard drive can clear it and slide it out. And as expected, this is a Quantum Fireball 6.4 gig IDE drive, as indicated by the sticker near the IDE port. I'll be using the same type of SD to IDE adapter that I used for the Voodoo build a couple of weeks ago. Of course, it won't fit in by itself, so I'm off to model another adapter that'll let me fit it in. The first one I printed didn't fit quite right, so this is the second version, and it's perfect. I'll be joining that with a 128 gig card because 128 gigs is the largest hard drive the iMac supports. So we'll go ahead and connect the IDE and power cables. Then screw it back into place, and it's time to reassemble and see if we're back in business. And success! The System 8.6 CD sees the new drive and recognizes the full 128 gig of the SD card. Since I want a triple boot, OS 8, OS 9, and OS X, I split it into three equal size partitions and then get started installing OS 8. And about 30 minutes later, the machine reboots and it's fully up and running for the first time in probably a decade. I don't know if the dead drive is why it was put into storage in the first place, or if the drive died while it was in storage, but I am glad to see it back up and running. The integrated text-to-speech engine in macOS is perhaps a little too much fun with all of these awesome voices. The light you see at the end of the tunnel is that of an oncoming train. Next, it was time to move on to installing OS 9, and, as you might expect, the installation was quick and easy. So far everything's been relatively painless, which is exactly why it was time for things to go sideways. The latest version of OS X that this iMac can run is Panther, version 10.3.9. So, I dropped the installer disk in and booted off of it. After booting up, it told me that I needed to go and download and install a firmware update from System 9 before I could install OS X. Okay, fair enough. So I reboot the machine to get back to OS 9 and...
The screen goes blank and never comes back up. I go through the basic troubleshooting, starting by unplugging it and plugging it back in. On startup, I get the regular chime, but the screen remains blank. After some quick googling, the first suggestion is to clear the PRAM, kind of like the BIOS settings on a PC. So I hold Option, Command, P and R down, and the machine boots up and it chimes twice as expected, but still no video. Next, it was suggested to reset the NVRAM. Now this requires keying commands into a command line, which I couldn't see, but I figured I'd go at it blind. So this time I hold Option, Command, O and F and enter the commands to reset the NVRAM, and success. The machine reboots just as it's supposed to, except still no video. Finally, I found some posts relating to this exact issue. It seems that, when booting off the OSX installer with the incorrect firmware, the installer would adjust some of the values related to timing with the CRT. Without the updated firmware, this rendered the internal display useless. There was even an entire document set on how to try and recover from it, but the host has long since disappeared from the internet. Luckily, the Wayback Machine had a copy of it, so I made a local copy and started reading. And the first warning is not to reset the PRAM or NVRAM, as this will make the situation much worse. F okay, well, even though there's no video on my machine, it's still booting, at least occasionally, so that left me some options. I pulled out a PowerMac G4 tower, swapped the drive from the iMac to the tower, and confirmed it was able to boot. From the tower, I copied the firmware update onto the drive and placed it in the startup folder of my OS 9 boot so that it would run when the iMac started up. From there, the theory was I'd have to press enter twice and it would be able to flash the firmware. I swapped it back and no luck. The machine didn't shut down as expected for the update after pressing return. Okay, so maybe I can use remote control software. So I swapped back to the Power Mac, installed the VNC remote desktop server, and then tested my VNC connection from my phone. And success! So I swapped the drive back to the iMac and only then realized the iMac wasn't pulling an IP address from my network. Finally, I decided to go with a fresh install of the OS. So I grabbed a spare 32 gig card, put it into the adapter, put the adapter back into the Power Mac, installed a fresh OS 9 install with VNC server, copied over the firmware update, swapped it back to the iMac, and this time I can see the iMac on the network. My VNC client connects and the VNC server crashes immediately. So I get an image of what's on the desktop and what it looks like, but I can't do anything to interact with it. Finally, I swap back to the Power Mac once again and test VNC access, and it complains about a missing optional extension. I put the extension in place, confirm I can VNC into the Power Mac, and then swap back again. And this time I connect to the iMac and it doesn't crash. So I quickly load the firmware update and it shuts down the computer as expected. Then I boot it back up in programming mode and wait for it to reflash the firmware. A few minutes later it beeps a few times, but without a screen I have no idea whether it succeeded or failed. So, I pull the power, plug it back in, press the power button, and I am greeted with this. <laughs> After days of struggling with this on and off, it's back, and it's running the latest firmware no less. And at this point my puck mouse had arrived from eBay, so I decided to clean it as well. There was a rather dubious looking hair in the plastic housing, but luckily the plastic pieces just snap off, so it was no big deal to shake it out. Then I turned my attention to the ball and rollers. I love the two-tone ball and how it looks as the mouse moves around, even though your hand would logically be covering this at all times. Flipping over the mouse, there is a circular panel that twists and comes loose and the ball drops out, and the rollers are filthy. So I used a plastic pry tool and slowly worked off all the gunk off the rollers to get them nice and clean. Then I dropped the ball back in, replaced the panel, and yeah, it moves a lot better. Unfortunately, it doesn't make the mouse any more comfortable in the hand. This mouse is notorious for being one of the worst ever designed and it's not much of an exaggeration. Due to its circular shape, it is very easy to lose track of the orientation of the mouse. You may think you're holding it straight, only to have each of your movements end up on the diagonal because it's off on one side. But hey, if I'm gonna own an iMac, I want it to be complete. Now it was finally time to tackle installing OS X and hopefully do it this time without breaking my machine. And yeah, with the proper firmware installed, this time OS X installed with no problems, bringing the iMac up to a desktop more resembling modern Macintoshes. I had hoped that OS X would give me my best bet for installing modern software, but since the G3 processor was already two operating systems behind, the highest version of OS X supported by this iMac just isn't new enough. After searching online and testing various browsers, the vast majority of websites still wouldn't load, 
since the browsers lack support for modern security on websites. In fact, while I do want to have all three operating systems running, it seems like most software, particularly games, are going to be focused on System 8 and System 9. So where do we start? Well, one thing I remembered being advertised all over the place back then was the ability to run Windows on these systems using software called Virtual PC. So I installed Virtual PC version 3.0 with Windows 98 and... Yeah, this is definitely Windows 98 running on a Mac. But while it looks the part, performance is definitely lacking. It takes quite a while to start up, and then it struggles to do things as simple as playing a MIDI, with the audio ending up garbled and the timing being all wrong. Okay, so maybe Windows 98 isn't going to be a great candidate for gaming on the iMac, but there are plenty that support it natively. And since I didn't have a lot of experience with gaming on a Mac, I asked the vintage Apple subreddit what games people like to play. One game suggested on Reddit, as well as from some of my friends, was a game called Bugdom. You play as a roly-poly bug running around the insect kingdom, trying to free ladybugs and collecting tokens and power-ups. The gameplay is super smooth and the environments are bright and vibrant, which is a perfect match to the colorful and shiny exterior of the iMac. It also seems to be the perfect game for first-time gamers, as the difficulty level and number of hits you can take without dying is quite forgiving. And there's something just so satisfying about lightly kicking an enemy until they just give up. Nobody dies here. I may not have known where I was going half the time, but I was sure having fun. I look forward to revisiting this after the video and exploring even more of the levels. Next, I loaded up Descent 3, and to be honest, I had zero expectations after the menu loaded. The cursor was laggy and choppy, taking like a second to catch up after I stopped moving the mouse. But to my surprise, when the demo level loaded, it played great. Movement was nice and fluid, and I had very little trouble navigating my way through the starting level. But, unfortunately, as I went from the tutorial level to the first level, the game hardlocked the Mac. Maybe there's a patch available or this is a known issue, but this is where my testing with Descent 3 ended. Next up, long before they were living large or going out on hot dates, it was just The Sims. A staple of early 2000s gaming, it runs just fine on the iMac, allowing you to build all your wacky house designs to your heart's content. I opted to forego wall coverings to keep enough money to build this pool in the backyard. Because, as you know, if you play The Sims, you have to make one of them swim and then remove the ladder. Okay, even after 20 years of playing this game, I still can't make myself actually let them drown. Gameplay was pretty smooth except when you move your view around. Here, it would become a little choppy until the camera caught up, but it wasn't enough of a problem to take away from the fun that is The Sims. And what would a print-and-play retrospective be without featuring a Star Trek game? Star Trek Elite Force, much like many other Quake 3 games, saw a release on Macintosh PowerPC-based systems. And while I would have played the hell out of this back in the day, I'm coming off the Elite Force experience from the Voodoo 5 system a couple of weeks ago. By comparison, the graphics don't look as good, and the gameplay is choppier. Perhaps I'm just spoiled by better hardware these days, but it didn't feel nearly as good. It also didn't help that the included Apple mice only include a single button, meaning that your secondary fire is always going to be relegated to the keyboard. Sure, you can swap it out for a two-button mouse, but that defeats the purpose of tracking down the original mouse in the first place. When I tried to launch Diablo 2, it complained of missing software. I started poking around on the CD, hoping that they'd included it, but instead, I found the trailer for the original Final Destination. Yeah, this stuff doesn't really get popped onto CDs that often anymore. Diablo 2 played great, with the only slowdowns occurring when it was loading from the optical drive. I have to compliment the speakers on this machine. They sound way better than they have any right to. 
Until it's safer outside the camp and the gates are reopened, I'll remain here with my caravan. I hope to leave for Lutka Lane before the shadow that fell over Tristram consumes... It's been a long time since I played Diablo 2, so I really enjoyed wandering around and the first dungeon crawl. Overall, this is definitely one I'm going to have to revisit after the video is over. So, how does it feel to use a G3 iMac after over 20 years? Well, even with the heartache of thinking I had killed it only to bring it back to life, I thoroughly enjoyed the experience. There's just something so charming about its late 90s aesthetic. I'm sure I've just scratched the surface of all the things there are to do with this machine, and I can't wait to find more undiscovered games and software to try on it. And I love the way that the slot load optical drive gobbles up CDs, and how you toss them into the trash to eject them. This is definitely my favorite change between the early units and the revised model. Now, ordinarily, I'd handle the sign-off to my videos myself, but today I think I'm going to let the iMac do it for me. Thank you so much for watching to the end of the video. Did you have a G3 iMac when they were released? If so, what games and software did you use? Let me know what I'm missing. If you're new here, please consider subscribing so you won't miss any future videos. And if you want to help out with future videos, check out my Patreon like all the awesome people on the screen now did. Alright, that's it for this one. But I'll see you again in a couple of weeks for another print and play retrospective.